Welcome, friends. I know folks are still trickling in. We'll get started in just one more moment. So if you need to take a bit to settle, that's invited. Beautiful. I want to thank everyone who's joining us both online and uh, also a big thank you to some of the young adults who are gathered in person at Pendle Hill as we speak. Um, we are at the end of our young adult program this year, continuing revolution, nurturing uh, spiritually grounded abolition. I'm really grateful uh, that Kay Melkor Hall has agreed to offer um, uh, this program this evening, along with some of our wonderful artists, um, we'll be exploring how reparations is to justice as art is to freedom, linking healing and creativity. I mentioned earlier, but my name is Lena Blunt. I've been working as the Continuing Revolution Coordinator at Pendle Hill, um, so I'm grateful to join you in that capacity this evening. Also be just your MC tonight, sharing a little bit of guidance as we work our way through together. Um, I will uh, briefly just uh, invite folks to keep in mind that uh, though this is a part of Pendle Hill's first Monday lecture series, which is open to everyone, it is also the keynote address of our Continuing Revolution program, which is our young adult program. So when we get to the question and answer at the end of this evening, we'll be prioritizing the questions and voices of the young adults who have uh, come out to our space. Um, I will continue just orienting us a bit to uh, our evening. Uh, you may notice that you're muted. Um, you can also only chat with hosts and co-hosts. Um, we ask that you uh, please only use the chat for any tech difficulties or, of course, when we get to the question and answer, that's really welcome. Um, we're also, uh, I am at Pendle Hill right now, so that means that I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Lenape peoples, um, folks who were the, uh, originally from up, up to the Hudson, all the way down to the Delaware, Lenape Hoking traditional territories, um, some of whom were displaced um, to places like Oklahoma and the Midwest by uh, white European colonization and genocide some of whom are still on their traditional lands to this day um, and in relationship with us at Pendle Hill. Um, so I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the lands that we are all calling in on. Um, and then I will uh, introduce our speakers a little more. I'm really, really delighted uh, to have Melkor joining us this evening to discuss how reparations is to justice as art is to freedom, linking healing and creativity. We also have a number of incredible artists joining us this evening. Melkor will introduce some of them. They'll introduce themselves. I'm really so grateful uh, to have folks joining us. Melkor is a popular educator, writer, and researcher is the author of Naming a Transnational Black Feminist Framework, Writing in Darkness, and is a co-editor with Gwen Kirk of Mapping Gendered Ecologies, Engaging with and Beyond Eco-Womanism and Eco-Feminism. She's both a resident scholar at Brandeis University's Women's Studies Research Center and the executive director of the African American Education and Research Organization at Melcore Quick Meeting House, founded by her mother and first teacher, Paula Quick Hall. I've had the great good fortune of uh, building relationship with Melkor through 
um, some of the work that she co-leads, um, especially around reparations. Um, Melkor has co-led a writing workshop for people of color and a reparations workshop for U.S.-based white inheritors of wealth um, and an artist-led freedom visioning workshop uh, for individuals interested in our shared liberation, which um, we will hear some more about this evening. Also very grateful to Count Melkor as a friend. Now invite us all to enter into some silent worship. And then Melkor will speak out of the silence. All right. <laughs> um, I first want to say that I'm really excited to be here with um, this group. I, I had the opportunity to hang out with um, young Quakers and another young and not young at heart. I forget what exactly the expression is um, on campus in another um, context. And so I'm really excited to be rejoining you virtually um, in this in this context. Um, and I'll also I'll just say that it's it's always interesting giving a um, talking about freedom and thinking about what that means even in the context of um, being here with you as being in these little boxes as sort of being captive. <laughs> Um, and so I just, I'm going to encourage some things, you know, that, that if you need to, if you want to get up, move around, do bio breaks in the mid-sentence, mid <laughs> feel free to, to do that. And also know that um, I am, many of you, in, anybody who, who's, who, knows, who knows me and has spent some time with me knows that I'm um, a caregiver for my grandmother, um, who you will hear in the background. Um, she is free to do as she likes during this, during, during this um, lecture and at other times. And so um, I may pause sometimes as she makes noises, other times I won't. Um, and so you'll, you'll get used to those sounds and noises and um, I encourage you to think of them the same way you would, you know, background ocean noises <laughs> or something like that. Um, so I, I'm so pleased, so excited to have three um, artists with me who are actually going to be a part of this lecture. Um, uh, and, I, and I think, for them, I think that yes, that you can see them spotlighted now. Um, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit later, so as you get to that. But I'll just say that you know I'm I'm here's you know a sort of keynote, but I, my sort of co keynotes here are um, Daryl Ann Gain, Macala, Marla Lenore McLeod, Destiny Palmer, and um, we are sort of a, a new collaborative group. I would call us, and and I'm really excited that they join me here today. So I am going to experiment with um, sharing my 
my screen just a moment, um, just as a way to sort of keep us keep us sort of in a in a in a flow for the evening. It's amazing to believe it's already 14 after <laughs> so how we schedule these things, right? Um, so <clears throat> you've already heard a little bit about the, um, the, 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 the title of, of this. And I'll also mention that right now I'm, I'm currently executive co-director um, of African-American Education and Research Organization. I've been thinking a lot and doing a lot with collaborative work. And so um, let me just make sure you should be able to see this now, but let me know if you, you can see it as a full screen probably now, I hope, um, um, that I think a lot about how I can work with people. And so people who have been with me in reparations workshop or in other contexts know that I'm often thinking about how we can share responsibility and share accountability for this kind of work. And so I now have an executive co-director, um, Cheryl Jefferson Page. And so I just wanna mention that, that I'm no longer singular executive director, but an executive co-director of ARO. So I thought I'd just do it, you know, some snapshots of sort of how, how we came here to be this moment um, and just say a little bit about, about the history so in 2019, I, I um, facilitated an Aiming for Justice workshop um, that didn't have any material transfer connected to it, but it was about thinking through questions of reparations, um, specifically for Black people. But I would say that for me, that is um, necessarily entangled with questions about uh, repair with in um, solidarity with indigenous peoples. Um, and I was, I was asked to, to come back the, the following year. Um, I know there's a small typo here, so I'll, I'll correct that typo in, in what I'm saying. But um, in 2020, I, I did come back, but I told the people from 2019 that if I were to come back that I would want um, for there to be some material transfer. And so $10,000 was transferred to individuals and organizations selected by the, the actual participants. And they had an opportunity to talk about and explore their own relationship to privilege and wealth to understand Hello? what and which individuals, which organizations contributed to them having the position in society that they, that they have in 2021. And again, here's the typo, 40 plus um, aiming for justice participants transferred more than $65,000 to black legacy residents of a neighborhood block impacted by gentrification. In that year, I raised the, the threshold from $10,000 to $20,000. And as you can see that, um, that was a year where people were uh, definitely at home and we're doing a lot more on Zoom. Um, and so, and so that was, that was that year. And then I asked at the end of the workshop, never assuming that we would continue whether people wanted to come back, they said yes. And in 2022, again, assume that these numbers are adding one. Um, there was a much smaller group um, of aiming for justice cohorts transferred more than $60,000 to the National Black Food and Justice Alliance's Mutual Aid Fund for Black Farmers. Um, and then um, in 2023, um, interest waned in the program and the program was canceled because the $40,000 pledge wasn't met. And, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that even um, even $10,000 wasn't met. So just saying a little bit about sort of what that trajectory has been in the, in the program. Um, and so in those two years, more than 120,000, well, in those three years, more than $130,000 transferred. So what I was left with was sort of thinking through a dilemma, even you know, as that program progressed, um, one, of the, one of the things that, um, I was noting was that interest um, among US space white inheritors of wealth. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to adjust. Okay. 
um, and resource redistribution seems to be ebbing and flowing with the visibility of, of black trauma in popular media. You could see um, that, that as there were more, uh, more discussion and more actual sort of video evidence about, about black, related to black trauma, there was increased interest um, in, in engaging questions of resource redistribution um, and reparations. I also noted that, um, and I'd say that this is from a position of being engaged with universities that many sort of morally driven white folks um, turned increasingly to academic text as their guide to historical knowledge and appropriate resolution of past harm. So, you know, the more that I can sort of figure out what's going on here, the more I can figure out sort of what is appropriate to do. Um, and alongside that, I saw relatively little attention given to the gap in between what must be done to resolve the past and what is required to prepare us um, as a society for a more just future. The assumption being that if you, you know, if you sort of fix the past, that then we arrive someplace. And I, and I, you know, um, believe that there's a gap there. Um, and then I'll also note, and this is, you know, sort of one of the more, my more controversial thoughts, even though they're, they are in abundance. Um, inheritance, which is, you know, one of the tools sort of most critical for sustaining race-based inequities sort of conti was continuing unchecked. And so, um, you know, sort of even as there are these discussions about what one can afford to shift in some in some locations around resources, that the that the thing that makes the most difference is continuing. Wow. Um, and then finally, uh, I was concerned that thinking about visions of artists that those visions were being ignored or undervalued as potential blueprints for freedom futures. So the inspiration, um, part of the inspiration is, is Black Lives Matter movement being flooded with art as the backdrop for political protest, high profile funerals, press events, making artists both hyper visible and also unseen. I mean, many people can talk about and name, you know, murals uh, that were that were erected, um, drawings that happen, sort of live drawings during funerals, but are often unable to name the artist. Often, un, you know, unable to talk about their body of work. Um, also, for me as an international relations scholar, uh, I was attentive to questions of art in other locations where we have a lack of freedom. Um, and in particular, thinking about um, US-based detainees at Guantanamo Bay um, as they release an, a, a book of art and thinking about art as both documentation and resistance um, to, to, to torture in that case. Um, and then just thinking about the value of black art rising and falling with, with popular media attention to black death. And I'm going to um, show a, a quick video um, from this from this person, um, Mansoor Adafi, who is who's one of the former um, detainee who talks about the role of of art. And so I'm going to do that. Give me just one second. I'm going to share that video in a in a separate screen, so you'll see. Let me stop sharing for just a moment and then I'll go directly to that video. And let me know once the video starts, if you for some reason are unable to hear the sound, just let me know right away because that's not my intention. and fly to Guantanamo. Hey 
guys. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever there. My name is Mansour Abdaiti. Uh, I have another name, Smiley Travel Maker 441, and the worst of the worst. I was released in 2016 to Serbia, what we call 102.0. I'm from Yemen. Now I am from nowhere. Imagine around 800 men, different background, 50 uh, nationality, 20 languages, all kind of people, all kind of different mindset, beautiful diversity. We become part of each other life. So our culture, our languages, our talents, everything just mixed together. I call it, you know, the beautiful Guantanamo. Art born from the ordeal at Guantanamo. It was part of us, part of our life, part who, part who, uh, of who we, who we are. Started with the singing, poets, some of the brothers who have like a talent of uh, poetry, their poems, it like, it came like a stroke. They need to, they need to get it out. And like, Hey guys, please, 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 me, uh, help me to memorize. So each of us would check a phrase of the uh, poem and memorize it until like, oh, I finish now. And we circle it together. And the first thing we need, we have nothing. We have only styrofoam, clamshells, and cups. Sometimes we draw hearts or tree or sun or moon. So start there is like really hunger for art for writing i mean the things that people take it for granted every single day just holding a pen it was like you feel like you are free now so they relax the rules they start negotiating with us we set our terms here's our terms guys you know we requested but you know coming and living better life better uh, better food better um, health care uh, family communication uh, classes one of the classes came art class at the beginning it was hard you know because many restrictions our rules everything was new and they didn't want to give us what we need we demanded over and over then we got art teacher who is like a phd in art his name is Adam. Then the art starts from there. He really wanted to help and he started encouraging us to paint. Then the revolution of art started, really. Art held, it became like a therapy. It held memories, secrets, time, it's part of, of our time there. It reflects who we are, you know, and the things you want you want to have new life. The thing we miss, we miss like sky, stars, the sea, ships. We paint our fears, you know, sometimes you need to get, to get it out. It became a way of communication. I know Sabri, when uh, the ICRC came or the uh, lawyers, can you prepare my painting from my, from my uh, daughter because we have celebration or Eid or wedding or new baby came or something. You have to write something. Sabri, uh, one of the artists would paint, I would write something uh, nice. It became like uh, a collective work and teamwork. We changed the, the surrounding inside the, the jail into like a museum because it was uh, cement, dark. So we start painting and making signs and beautiful painting everywhere. We start even constructing other, other stuff, shapes and like also cabinets or tables out of cardboard. We made a lot of furniture, we made windows, we made a lot, a lot, a lot of things. The first one who started using art at gallery and uh, exhibit our art, the administration, US government. When journalists or tours or visitors came, they showed them, look, how we treat them, we give them art classes. It became like our art uh, is used to improve US image about Guantanamo. When we exhibited, yeah, duh, that was going to happen. We are going to exhibit our art to the world. No, when you do it, because, you know, as a Muslim, by default, you are a tourist. And any art of you, it's like tourism. When you paint, you are not in jail. You are not shackled. You are not being chained to the floor. You are inside your painting. Imagine you live for those years and years in solitary confinement, torture, abuses, you know, totally disconnected from the, the world from your family, from everyone. What make you as a person, each of us, 
It's our memories. If someone take that memories, it could like a shell. So when people start painting, you know they started to find a way to escape out of Guantanamo, to go back to the previous life, to themselves. So art helped us to connect to ourselves first and connect it to the world outside. So now I'm fighting for the freedom of my brothers at Guantanamo. I'm fighting for the freedom of our art from Guantanamo because art just like us, a living being. And maybe it will die, but the art will continue living as witness about that place and about us all. So, uh, and some of you may may already be familiar with um, that work, but I, in particular, found that um, sort of one of many sort of powerful engagements of the connection between um, art and freedom, um, because I think that, um, especially in a in a context where often uh, the art is seen as as something that um, isn't necessary, isn't um, required, but that was sort of a quite powerful endorsement of the potential for of art for envisioning um, freedom in a, in a future possibility. And so the, the vision here um, was to commission um, the work of Black feminist artists to co-develop and co-lead a reparative workshop um, to have a pledge threshold of, of $10,000, which is the initial thread when, when I started aiming for justice. Um, and different from the, from the aiming for justice workshop that there would be multiracial, uh, multiracial group of participants um, pledging based on intersectional identities and resource realities. Um, monies that would, you know, be a commitment both to the to the work of these artists writ large and their and their freedom to be able to continue to do work. Um, th that the featured artists would give talks on their commissioned works. Um, that participants would create both individual and collective freedom art during the workshop, and that select art pieces with detailed what I'm calling freedom vision captions. So. You know, both about who the person is and, and what how the art piece represents freedom to them would be included in a traveling exhibit. Who's the lineup? <laughs> so the artists um, are Daryl and Gay McCalla. And, and let me just say that everybody is many things. And so I just pick some things. I'm sure they're looking at these like shirt descriptions. <laughs> like, where's the rest of my bio? Feel free to read the bio on the web page, um, among other things, is you know, a, a college friend um, and current friend, uh, sculptor, illustrator, and mixed media artist, um, Destiny Palmer, uh, paint, uh, painting and color historian and theorist, I'm calling her because of our conversations about color and what it means. Um, Marlon or McLeod, sculptor, portrait, and textile artist doing many things. Um, and so just just know that even as these these artists speak that um, again they 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 engage in many ways, many different forms and conversations. Um, and so each of them is going to say a little bit about um, well, they're going to be free to talk how they want to talk about their art. but uh, we're gonna start with Daryl um, and then go to Destiny and then Marla. And so, Zero, I can stop sharing my screen. I just picked, you know, of course, a piece of your art, but I'll stop sharing my screen and then give it to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that is actually, I would just like to talk about that sculpture real quick. That's a sculpture that um, is a work in progress, which it seems like most things I do are a work in progress in one way or another. And um, it is meant to be a sculpture that's meant to be on a bench but it's like a sculptural bench so it's a bench you can sit on so that was the part where it was actually um it was actually a photo of my cousin and my aunt when when um we were in jamaica for my grandmother's funeral and um i'm hoping at some point I, i'm a sculpt i'm a lot of things but i'm a sculptor and um, i'm gonna share my screen um it says it says um you cannot start screen share 
I've now unshared mine. I was showing that sculpture, so now you can try again. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Um, okay, well, so I've been doing um, art for a long time, and um, I actually, it was kind of crazy with 2020. I think 2020 was crazy for everyone. But I kind of stopped doing art. And part of it was, it seemed like everyone wanted a mural, but or something like right when George Floyd, you know, right when everything was happening, everyone wanted a mural. And these people wanted to pay me $50 for a mural. And I've been doing murals for like 20 years. And then soon after that, I applied for something in Boston. And it was like this huge budget and I was a finalist for it. And it almost made me have a crisis. Like I'm the same person, you know what I mean? You're offering me $50 to do a whole mural in one situation and then a huge amount of money to do something when you've known who I am for 20 years. Um, so I kind of had a little, little bit of a crisis <laughs> and I stopped doing art. And that, you know, other stuff was going on too. And um, and oh my god, hold on. Um, and I I just stopped doing art. And just just recently, like I, I went through a lot of different things. And I really, in a lot of ways, from from COVID, from before COVID, from a lot of things, my whole life, I just felt lost. And I felt like um, lost, broken and trying to put pieces together of my life to, um, but I can't share my um, screen right now. I'm still, hold on, I'm still trying. Um, sorry. And I am still very, I'm still very scattered. Um, Zoom US may not be able to record the content of your screen. Okay, I'm still very scattered, but I was able to get myself together a bit doing this um, project. So no. I've, been thinking, I've been thinking about a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different things um, that relates to, can you see my screen? Okay, a lot of things that relate to my life. And um, so I, I, and I was just, I usually keep a journal and I was really just, because so much was going on and so, there were so many changes and I was thinking differently about things, I really stopped keeping a journal and I started like scribbling down thoughts that I didn't want to escape me. Um, so rather than a coherent journal that I usually would have, I just had a lot of different thoughts about things. And um, One thing, I felt like there was a domino effect in my life, basically, of, um, I guess in some ways, like I had maybe internalized some lies and some beliefs and this and that, and like, I just went through one thing and then another and another, and then it was really difficult, but in that process, I felt like in the process of like feeling unstable and feeling out of place and everything, I um I started writing down things and like this art piece kind of developed from that. And um the one that you're looking at now, it's a mosaic. It's two, it's two like details of a mosaic. And um it's part of a series that I want to do. And this one is called Jamaican Dreams coming in from the Cold War. And I'm a lot of different things and I kind of am in different things in different contexts. Um, but one thing I am is Jamaican because my father is from Jamaica and Jamaica is a country where like half of the population has migrated. Um, and there's like so many incredible things about being Jamaican and being Jamaican. 
incredible things. Like it's this tiny island in some ways. In some ways, it's this tiny impoverished island. In other ways, like who doesn't know Bob Marley and Usain Bolt and Shelly Ann Fraser Price and everyone else? You know what I mean? Who doesn't know these people? Marcus Garvey. Who doesn't know these people? These Jamaicans that are some from this small, black, impoverished island. But it's a small, black, impoverished island that has been influenced by the world and has influenced the world. And there are places that are so huge and they don't win multiple gold medals at the Olympics. You know what I mean? And Jamaica has. You know, Jamaica swept the Olympics. And Jamaicans have funny jokes because, you know, like one thing that was spoken about in my family in hushed tones was that um, both my grandparents migrated to the United States, but they never told us that. Um, it was just that my father, you know, did well in school, got a scholarship, went to England. Um, did well in school, you know what I mean? All that, you know what I mean? And families don't tell their children the whole story. You know what I mean? So it's only when you get older that it's like, oh, like my grandparents also came to the United States and they did like migrant labor and domestic work. And it's like a secret. Um, it's a secret and it's one of many secrets that like, oh my God, like I'm almost shaking talking because it's like I'm telling my family secrets. Um, that my, you know, because that's not broadcast in my family. That's not our narrative. You know what I mean? That we came here to do migrant labor and domestic work. That's not the narrative I grew up with. You know what I mean? So. And I can understand why they didn't tell us now. Um, given, you know, what I've learned since I've grown up about my family, about um, history, you know what I mean? About different cultures. And so really, I just have had a lot going on in my life. And I feel like this piece and I stopped doing art because like I got some success. I got some success in 2020. And given my history, I'm like, wait a minute, like all this time I've been struggling. And now, you know what I mean? Now, you know what I mean? Another black guy gets killed. It's, it's videotaped. We're all at home. People do what they do, you know what I mean? Whether it's rioting or protesting or, you know what I mean? Demanding that art change, you know? Demanding that there be a shift in the narrative. And for me, it's like, okay, well, I've been here the whole time and I've been talking the whole time and I've been doing art the whole time. So it was interesting to see everything that happened in 2020 and to hear other artists say that they they also, everyone wanted a mural. No one wanted to pay. You know what I mean? Then time passes. Um, basically people riot, everyone wants a mural. No one wants to pay. And then the cities are like, wait a minute, we have money. You know what I mean? Let, let's finally, address these Confederate monuments. You know what I mean? Let's finally look around at the world we're living in and the messages that the art is sending us. And for my thing, it's like, I, I really resented it because I'm the same, per I'm not the same person I've been the whole time. I'm not the same person I've been the whole time, but why now? Um, why now? Like, why now? You know what I mean? And then I am not criticizing people who 
went through a door that was closed for a hundred years. You know what I mean? But with some situations I was going through, I couldn't do it at that time. Um, I couldn't do it at that time because, because in the meanwhile, my whole life is like the same people you're now offering me opportunity, but I didn't, I wasn't just born. You know what I mean? I've been here, you know what I mean? Decades, I've been here decades. And I've been doing this for decades, you know what I mean? And I just, in doing it in a lot of ways, a lot of ways it was wonderful, it was great, I loved it. But in a lot of ways it was, um, it was not good. And um, for me, as a woman artist, I felt like, okay, I'm a nobody, I'm doing art. You know what I mean? But I've done art long enough that now I'm a somebody. So I'm gonna, you know what I mean? Dress up a little bit more than usual. You know what I mean? And then friends are still telling me like, you, you look like a bum, like dress nicer so that you can have people respect you. You know what I mean? <laughs> And it's like, okay, fine, you know what I mean? I'll do it, you know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, but I didn't, I thought I was here as an artist who was dressing nice for a nice occasion. But what I didn't realize is I was on display too. And with this piece, because of that factor that I feel like, okay, I'm an artist. I've gotten to a point where I'm like at shows where you know what I mean? Other people besides just my friends are coming. You know what I mean? And it's almost like telling a child, <laughs> I hate to say this, I hate to say this, but it's almost like telling a child, like, um, don't take what you want the most from strangers. You know what I mean? Because you grow up and they're, they can, some strangers who are predators, they can look at you and they can read you. You know what I mean? So she's nervous. She's on display. She's here for her art. That's cute. She thinks she's an artist. Let me try to mansplain her artwork to her so that I can lure her, you know what I mean? Somewhere else. And I know I, I probably sound paranoid, but um, some people, they just get off on like, I don't even know what, oh, basically, oh, that's, oh, you're an artist. That's so cute. You know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, you actually are an artist. That's even cuter. You know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, I have a gallery or something. Come on. You have a gallery, white, you know what I mean? And I'm like young and naive. So someone's telling me you have a gallery or, you know what I mean? Here's this commission that we want you to do or whatever. You know what I mean? So through all of that, and I'm not trying to discourage people from going out there in the world. Um, and I'm not trying to discuss, I'm, I'm not trying to um, discourage young people from going out and saying, this is a world, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not just in it as a, I'm not just in the passenger seat, like I'm living, um, I'm living in this world and I can be me and I can go out, you know what I mean? But um, I can go out and I can be an artist and I can do all those things, but I just felt like a lot of people kind of took advantage of my like passion for art in some ways. And some people you wouldn't think like, I don't know, if someone was like, oh my God, I'm an artist. And then I got lured, you know what I mean? To some unsafe place. I'd be like, really? You got lured to some unsafe place? Like what happened? You know what I mean? That's what I would think, but um, so anyway, all that stuff happened. I kept trying, I kept trying, I kept trying, I kept trying. I wasn't very successful at anything. 
And then 2020 happened and then I'm successful at multiple things. But the thing is my self-esteem has been battered so much all the way up to 2020. So Daryl, I just want to make sure I want to make sure we're <laughs> I'm, I'm scattered all over the place. I'm, I'm scattered all over the place. If you want to redirect so, me, redirect me because I will wander. <laughs> I'll wander yeah, anywhere. I mean, but I think I think what you've shared is important. I mean, part of part of what um we're talking about sort of ebbs and flows and you know sort of being what it means to be an artist to to sort of be thought of in, in these commodified terms oh. and then um, you know, sort of you're big when you're big and then you're not when you're not. And, and, and that can, you know, sometimes people forget that there, that there are humans behind that, that there are people who are experiencing, um, the things that are being videotaped and surveilled and the things that are not. And so, um, you know, people will have time to sort of come back to you and questions. Um, but I'm going to, if you could stop sharing your screen, I want to make sure I'm going to, we're going to have, um, go to to destiny a little bit and I didn't I mean I, I just had a sort of placeholder for different different folks and so um I don't necessarily need to to share my screen here Hello. which is um and that's my grandmother alerting us to presence <laughs> um D E N C E N so I'll let Destiny, if you want to go, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, good evening, all. I'm going to see if I could share my screen really quickly. Um, can you all see that? OK. Um, so um, I love, um, Melkor, that you named me as a um, color historian that is like true. I, I don't think I can give it to myself, but I am really grateful that someone else gave it to me so I can run with it. Um, a lot of my work, all of my work has to do with color. And the more that I kind of continue with things, um, I navigate through various types of histories. And um, where I currently am isn't where I thought I'd be, certainly um, since last year. Um, but I think I, I, what's interesting is that the more that I continue, the more that I make sense of some of this color work. Um, it started um, in about 2017, where I was exploring a lot of what came out of it was the color yellow. Um, and I started really trying to be descriptive about what I was doing with it and what it was describing. Um, and I started, I start with this piece because um, it, it's written in it is um, they picked cotton so that I could paint on it. And I think that that is one of these kind of overviews of my work where I'm trying to reimagine or reclaim um, color as it's described in a really narrow and kind of Western, even more so like American lens for color. Um, so we think of like yellow is happy and sunshine. And um, for me, I think it's really different. But what I think it allowed me to do was to name it and um, move through some more work that allows me to kind of explore history, the history of painting, um, colonial history, um, and the language of painting. Um, and so I moved through some works. And I go back to these paintings because I'm recognizing how much um, the colors that I've started to associate things with um, are found in whole paintings. Um, so this is a painting that I've went back to, which has the backdrop of yellow um, and has these kind of variations of blue in it um, that I would describe as my black and blue series, which kind of talks about harm um, and black bodies. Uh, more recently, I've been exploring um, and I'll just go through these as I'm talking, but um, I've been exploring the color fuchsia has been like the way that I've been describing describing the rage of a black woman. Um, but in them, you can kind of see um, this leaning towards orange, which is the work that I'm working on now. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, so I think my work has kind of moved through these um, vehicles of 
of um of installation as a way to kind of explore some more um some some more telling kind of thing so um the ways in which I'm utilizing all of the gallery space, um, including the wall. So this wall backdrop color is actually my skin tone. Um, Home Depot, Ben Sherwin will call it um, Spanish chestnut. Um, so a lot of what I'm doing is trying to really pull together some of the content and the work through installing it in various spaces. The work that I'm currently working on now is a series on orange. Um, and while you were talking, I was kind of letting that be the backdrop of um, some more drawings. So um, I'm really excited that I have this opportunity to explore orange, which is more biographical, more biographical than work has ever been, I'd say in the past like seven years. So I'm really excited. Um, and so this is kind of exploring fuchsia again a couple years ago um, where my mural work and my studio work is kind of meeting at the, the same place um, at a center point um, because I really do enjoy making really large paintings and taking up space. And so I recognize how powerful that is. And um, when I can, I'm gonna do it. And when I can't, I'm gonna figure out how. So um, the work, just continues to kind of poetically move or ebb and, ebb and flow between older works, newer works. Um, this is a piece that's down in Philadelphia right now um, where I'm kind of looking at the color periwinkle as a resting place for black folks um, and describing rest. Um, and, and so I was collaborating with some poets down there for a project, um, a breath, a slow forgotten, blue with desire, compassion to heal. Um, and I'll leave, I'll stop at this one where it says reclamation, um, reclaiming peace is my form of resistance. So a lot of the work, you feel free to ask questions because I kind of threw a lot at you, but um, as a color historian, I get to redefine <laughs> color and um, really think about how it's divisive in a lot of art making. So thank you. You know, I said color historian and theoretician, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope I hope you claim all of it. <laughs> yeah, and so I just you know just as a as a recap, on our third artist and grandma's <laughs> is feeling very inspired and active. So please, <laughs> she she is also talking a lot right now. So we just um, listen through oh, that. But so. Started with Daryl, <laughs> went to Destiny. This is Marla. This is, and, and some of these are just the work where I met the person or so I interacted with them or reminds me of some Hello. piece of them. But also, um, this is one of the places where you get um, also a little bit of a sneak peek, a sort of a glimpse <laughs> into, the, into the commission works. And so, um, if you want, I can keep this page up and mute myself if you like, or I can take it down. So, and oh, pass no, it no, no, that's way. perfect. That's okay, great. great. So, um, hi, everybody. I'm Marla McLeod, and I want to thank you, uh, you all for hosting this space for us to have this time to talk and time to share um, our stories and our work and so on and so forth. Thanks to the other artists and Melkor for putting this together. But, um, Really, the work that you're looking up at here right now is it covers a, a, some of the bases of the work that I do. Um, I am an artist. I'm a working artist. I work in an interdisciplinary way, interdisciplinary, <laughs> where I'm working with sculpture, textiles, and I work in painting and drawing as well. And so I use those mediums in order to really do my other job. <laughs> which is an educator. Um, I love to teach and I love to share information and I love to research and really kind of, um, in a way, spread freedom through education, right? Through this, this lens of knowing almost. Um, but ultimately, when I was looking at the project and, and thinking about what the project was about, 
I was looking at those key words. And that would be that those reparations, that justice, art, and freedom. And so I wanted to really key in on what freedom was. And I had to, as an artist building a piece of work, understand what freedom meant to me. And in looking at in which most of my work is based within the Black body, no matter what form it takes on, that's essentially what it is talking about, the Black experience. And so I was looking at uh, what freedom meant for the Black body. And I was like, the freedom to be, especially in and of this moment, the freedom um, to actually be able to exist in our space that we are in at this time. And um, looking at that and looking at the space in which we exist at this time, what I quickly uh, went into with having done some education in psychology was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I'm gonna start with the base structure of that, but we're gonna tap back into it later because there's always more when you start doing research, right? Um, and really digging in. But I begin with this idea of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need and looking at the attainment of self-actualization and what that looked for, like for the black body. I quickly came to understand that that is a subject that is huge. And I didn't know, like, why did you take this on type of thing, right? It's like, oh my God, really, Marla? So <laughs> what I ended up doing is really splitting it. And if you look at the center image there, you'll see the textile piece that I started to, working, um, to work on. And that's just the base, right? So we start with Maslow's hierarchy and need and self-actualization being that idea of freedom as the base of this space. And then I put that in a circular um pattern and split it into three. Now, the reason why I split it into three with those three um, sort of the, the kind of like zebra pattern in the brown and gold. Um, so those three splits are three separate spaces for the three different black bodies that I actually end up um, and I am currently looking into, and that is the space of the black female body, the black male body, and the black queer body. And I wanted to look at what self-actualization looks like in each one of those spaces. Um, there are many, many questions that ended up happening, um, not too many answers, but a lot of um, explanation about different ways in which our Black bodies interact with these ideas of self-actualization and everything that falls underneath that being esteem, love and belonging, safety, and those physiological needs that we have. And then let me, because I talk a lot, I will get into it. So I got to hold myself and let me check on that time. How am I doing on time? <laughs> I'm terrible with this. Yeah, a I'm couple okay. more minutes. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. All right. So what I'm going to do is I really want to get into and talk about some of those things and the mannequin that you're looking at here. And as I began to work on the Black female body and some of the things that would could and some spaces in which we are um, excelling and so on and so forth. So I really began to look into these I, these uh, these ideas and the tiers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, what you can clearly see on this mannequin from the images is very prominently the red fist that is on the womb coming from the vagina area of the mannequin. And that is you would find that uh, symbol to bring in these ideas of a pregnancy, of what can be born, what is not born, um, thinking about the ideas of reproduction and the Black female body and what it is to be able to attain that. Um, and in some cases, especially when thinking about the Black female body, not only the ability in the conversations that we're having today about abortion, but historically with the Black female body and even in a larger view, the poor female body, there's the uh, American eugenics movement, right? So oftentimes a space, even though that black female body is, um, is fighting for reproduction rights, there are women, uh, more women than just the black female body fighting for those reproduction rights. And I wanna say that to take us back a little bit back into that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and bring it out into a wider view. And as you further research into many spaces in our history and even within the 
a lot of um, what we consider the base of a lot of our structures, right? Maslow's being one of the base structures of our understanding of psychological space or um, ideas that we exist with now. Maslow is also, that um, system of needs was also influenced by the Blackfoot, right? It is the Sika Sika that he was visiting for with six weeks that also has this hierarchy of needs that also exists, but it extends past the very westernized view of the individual in attaining that self-actualization and surpasses that into the space of community actualization. And I think that that larger story, um, it, it is important just as well. It all blends in and you begin to see, just like this is separated into those three and it tells one story, this particular cloth could be expanded. The people on this cloth, instead of being black bodies could very well be bodies that are in wheelchairs, right? The disabled and what are the things that are holding those bodies back from self-actualization. So this black body could very well be in a wheelchair. So just really thinking about the different spaces and how they interact and asking and uh, my audience are calling for my audience to really to take perspectives and think about how these are very separate spaces but many, many people could fit into those spaces depending on who they are. And they are, um, they in themselves can form this sort of collective and try to figure out ways in which our um, collective actualization, our community actualization can happen. But it's like, we have to think about everybody that is included in that space, right? Um, and start, I don't know, can start just, I just call for a, a, a deeper look into things, you know, those bigger stories, the the deeper meanings behind things. And I will talk forever if you let me. So let me hush now. <laughs> uh, thank you for letting me speak. And I hope I hope you guys enjoy the actual artwork. And as it gets done, I'm really excited um, to complete them. Uh, thank you. Grandma is calling out letters. Um, uh -huh. She used to, she, she, she wrote letters um, when she was young. She's write a lot of letters to the editors. And so hello. as some of the words disappear, except for the very first words you hear, you hear now letters. Um, and again, for me, hello. it seems appropriate that she would not be confined, but would be free to be herself in this space with us. So again, um, I hope that you find a way to welcome it. Um, I'm just gonna um, wrap up here just and say, um, let me make sure, I think you can still see my screen. Just some of the questions that, that we're asking here is what we can learn about freedom from black feminist art and artists. How do our perspectives change when art and artists lead movements? What is revealed about our own reluctance to advance justice when we create art with Hello. others? What is unlocked or unhinged in us when we are pushed to make tangible and visible our freedom visions? And how can a traveling art exhibit that reckons with our past and presence while inspiring freedom visions revolution, how can a traveling art exhibit that reckons with our past while inspiring freedom visions revolutionize the discourse on racial harm and repair? And with that, I'm gonna leave um, it open. I'm gonna pass it to Lena for whatever answers might be out there. <laughs> Hello. I'm really grateful I'm not alone in answering those questions. And I really love so much um, the context setting, um, the, the glimpses of yourself, um, all, all the artists have shared both in your work and in your stories and your voices. And it's a huge gift um, to get to share time with you all as our young adults are at the end of this program about nourishing visions of abolition. Um, I think the questions you left us with, with Melkor will, will keep resonating our uh, so 
juicy and helpful, I'm going to ask you to send them <laughs> so our, our young adults can keep sitting with those. <laughs> Um, that we can all keep sitting with those. Um, and I will, I'm just feeling rising in me one answer that comes to me about how this work could transform our movements or how this work might bring me to confront what comes up in me in my racial justice work is around the limits of my own imagination and confronting the ways that white supremacy both limits my imagination and has trained me to long for control in a certain way that's really harmful and really limiting on both art and true relationships. And if we're going to have build social movements that have any, I believe, any meaningful chance of winning. <laughs> it certainly cannot, they cannot be bound by the limits of the, the imagination of white supremacy. They cannot be bound by the imagination at all. Um, that's one, one attempt at an answer for now. Um, I know those answers will keep, uh, We'll co-create them. We'll keep exploring them together. Is there more there, um, Melkor, you want to, to say or to invite before we um, perhaps invite some of our young adults um, and folks to share some of their, their questions with you all? No, I mean, and, and it's funny because in part, I mean, it was a, it was an answers, you know, we have this question answers and the assumptions is, is that I have answers, but I mean, of course, you know, in the context of sort of a popular education Whoa. framing, I think that we, that we, that we find the answers together. And so, you know, feel free to ask your questions, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, that, you know, I'm, I don't I don't believe that we we hold the answers individually. I think mosaic mm. style, we, you know, we find ways to cobble together a, a new reality. Um, and we have to do that boldly. And so um, mm. you know, it's an it's an invitation and also a question, you know, there <laughs> it was a question at the end of that word, you know. And so um Hello. you know, I'm I'm happy to hear what's what's coming up for people and and maybe we can get to some partial answers together in the time we have left. Mm. Appreciate that. Uh, Jen, who I know is there with our, our young adults uh, at Pendle Hill, I'm curious if there are folks in the room with partial answers, partial questions, can, you know, anything they would like to share. I don't think we can hear the room there yet. I'm curious, Destiny, if you can um, tell us more about what orange means to you. Uh, ooh, well, I've decided that um, in this series, I typically do a lot of the research beforehand and really think about how you know, what's speaking to me and how I'm going to apply the color. This, um, this series is so about myself that I'm letting the work lead me and then pulling the research behind. But I will say that, um, you know, orange is a, so I, I describe all of my colors with characteristics, um, through my understanding of paint and, um, orange is, such a beautiful color, but also one of the most finickiest colors to work with, meaning that as you mix it with anything other than itself, um, it just goes almost awry, like immediately. Um, so if you've ever tried to like make orange darker, it just goes green really fast, right? And um, there's something really interesting about how much green 
uh, and orange is kind of taking on the work or think about this, like think about the orange is taking on the workload of another color to do this work. And this is a bit of a therapy session session for me because I really haven't been talking about this out loud, but I think about that. I think about um, orange is typically an opaque color, but um, also is still really transparent and yet very really vibrant. And so that the, it is a complicated color that I'm really excited to explore. But from a painter's perspective, for all of the time that I've ever been painting, it's the color I've avoided the most. Um, and so I think it says a lot um, about it being descriptive of myself. So I'm learning, I'm putting the work forward. I've been collecting a ridiculous amount of orange objects, which is kind of making me a little repulsed of the, the color, but I'm just, I'm just going with it, so. Can I, Can I just hello? say that? Oh, I'm sorry, Dara, were you gonna say something? Oh, I just wanna say from a generic perspective, oranges, the fruit are not orange. If you go to another country, and it's not totally genetic, genetically modified or whatever they do to make the fruit look on like almost plastic fruit. You go to Jamaica, oranges, and I'm sure a lot of other countries, oranges are not orange. They're like green and orange and like, they're, so, they're somewhat orange, but they're not the sun-kissed orange. <laughs> it's interesting because orange is one of the last colors to actually gain its name. Um, it actually isn't described in many languages um, as anything other than like red, yellow or yellow, red. This and um, so it is interesting because it does come from the fruit, but the fruit itself, like Daryl, you just said it, it's not actually that oranges aren't that color. But anyway, nothing like it, like a little bit of orange here or there, but like it's like a mango in Jamaica, an orange, it looks like here, it's like completely circular, completely orange. And there it's not, you know what I mean? And I don't know, that's one of the things I'm trying to think about was shifting, shifting, you know what I mean? If I tell, if I was to tell a child in this country, oranges are not orange, they're gonna think I'm crazy. You know what I mean? Or especially if they've never, maybe if they've been to another country or if they trust me. <laughs> but with a lot of these kids, like I'm discredited already. Just by saying Netflix used to come in the mail or oranges aren't orange or, you know, all these things that, it kind of takes a toll on you when you have to keep pretending that oranges are orange when they're not. You know what I mean? They're not. They're not, and we, and we, and you're in the society. You're expected to pretend so many things, and I feel like art is a way to um, like spell it out to somebody. You know what I mean? Whatever it is that needs to be spelled out, and I feel like with me and my domino theory, American dreams, it's two plus two equals four, and also I don't need you to explain to me things that I obviously know. Because I it's think it's also that I know it. So why are you telling me about it when you see it in my artwork? And it's spelled out for you, but you still want to, <laughs> you still want to like, oh, let me explain this to you. And I think it's also interesting. Um, um, we, we didn't, so I didn't, it, I, I mean, it might be obvious, but I didn't put any restrictions on the artist, on the Freedom Works. Um, but I, I think it's interesting, Destiny, that your piece is focused on orange, especially given the you know the theme of abolition that has been you know um, you know the that the that the young Quakers have been engaging. Um, also thinking about Mansur Gaddafi continuing to wear orange even after detention as, to say to say something to insist on some message about what is freedom and what is not freedom will forever be wearing orange. 
Um, you know, and you talk about freedom Hello. taking on the weight of other colors. And I mean, it, there is, I mean, we could talk about orange as a new black. I mean, we could go on and on and on. But that's what I mean when I talk about you as a color theorist, right? <laughs> I'm saying like, you know, I think that that these kind of discussions about where can art take us uh, uh, in connection to the things that we are, are accustomed to thinking is, you know, it, in some particular, in some small context, what does it mean when we get in a room with other people who are being pushed to think more creatively about the things that they think they know and imagine new places that maybe some of us have been partially to, and maybe some, you know, and, and other of us aren't yet ready to believe that they exist, but if we if we come together prepared to imagine it together, then something else might emerge at the end of the process. And so I think that, you know, for me, that's the real potential of this, of this workshop, this gathering. I want to agree. There was an author that I was listening to speak today. And this author, and I wrote it down literally, the author says that she thinks about the power that stories have, right? But not just the power that those stories have. She also thinks about the sharing, right? And the sharing power of the community and then collectively how that affects the interpretation of that story, right? And the, there's power even in the interpretation of that story. So I think those storytellers, as well as those people who are listening to those stories are very much so important in thinking about these ideas of communities and the ways that we can change um, things, and especially as artists, that's what we do. We, we telling somebody's story. We saying something about something. There's always <laughs> a meaning there. <laughs> Even if it's just by me, right? Well, hopefully there is more. <laughs> Marla, you've given a new meaning to the mannequin challenge. What is that? They're staying forever? <laughs> I got like 50 more mannequins in storage. Look, there's going to be a party. <laughs> That sounds challenging. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh definitely. <laughs> Trying to fit them all in here. I can only fit 10 bodies in my car in pieces. I'm an artist, <laughs> that's why I know that. <laughs> we'll take it out of context. She was referring to mannequins. Is there another question um, from from the young adults at Pendle Hill? Mm -hmm. Looks like. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I had a question. I'm glad we got to talk about orange. I was wondering about that as well. Um, I was thinking about um, that video that you played and about the U.S. government taking this art made by the um, people at Guantanamo and using it almost as a way to sanitize their image. And I guess I was thinking more broadly about, is there a danger to establishment forces taking your art and using it for sort of art? I'll, 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 excuse me for a uh, you know, not its original purpose. And I guess, how do you um, defend against that if that is a danger? That is a really good question. And as an artist, right, once you, there's almost like once you, you know that once you have released your art into space, there's a measure of control that's given up. Because as much as we try to control what the audience is going to receive from our artwork, we cannot. Right. And so once we have put it out there, it is whatever the people do with it um, in the context of the government taking that work and intentionally doing something with it that, that it wasn't intended. You know, that's a, um, another thing. And there's always and, and quite often spaces in which our work may be put in which we may not want it to. Right. Um, as we're here, we have the option of pulling it out of that space and being able to say something about that. But there's many artists, you know, and that's just art and context. Right. Um, and as we go through time and space, it could be used furthermore in spaces that we do not agree with. We just have no real control over that. That's what I think anyway. And to me, the sad thing is, I feel like whatever you do, it might end up being take, stolen, taken out of contact, something. And um, I had an interesting visit to just general art museums and there's stuff that was radical at its time that now like people don't even know what it means because 
the museum has somehow removed it from its original context and then put it in another context and told a different story about it in some cases. And the timing too with the museums, like now every museum has like multiple black artists, you know what I mean, in their galleries. And if you've been part of the art world, like, and you have a watch <laughs> or a calendar, you know that um, these museums are lying. You know what I mean? Like I would, that's what I resent like the needing to control the narrative. Like, okay, the times have changed. Let's pretend that we were the ones pushing for those changes. That's what some museums and a lot of people are saying to me or the ways some people are using artists. Let's pretend we were saying this all along and let's pretend we supported these people all along. But how did they get to be wonderful artists when the support wasn't there all along. You know what I mean? So why are they wonderful artists now? You know what I mean? They've been here in the community the whole time in Boston and other places. So I don't know, that's almost a fear of mine. Like I would, I would hate for like my art to be used against me in any way or used to tell a story, used to lie, used to deceive, used to um, twist a narrative, you know what I mean? And, and I'm supposed to be grateful, you know what I mean? That I'm being used, you know what I mean? <laughs> to tell a lie. Mm -mm. Because the destiny. Mm -mm. I was wondering, wondering what destiny, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I think there's something really interesting about, um, there's something really interesting about um, how the work is consistently um, contextualized. I think I'm really curious about how uh, media will lend itself to being able to capture um, and allow access to people to understanding the truth. Um, which I think is a little different when we're looking at some other movements. So some other, you know, museums in the past couple of years have used their kind of archive to share shows and um, recontextualize some movements and protests and um, activism in a particular way or artists as activists in a particular way. But we're in a time now where things get like truth gets to live in a space that isn't actually um, controlled in a particular way. So I'm really curious as to how social media will kind of lend itself to the, the like, can, like recontextualizing. I mean, we have like hashtag things that can be a search database now and um, it will be interesting. But yeah, I hope, I agree. I really hope that my work is not uncontextualized as it, as it is meant to be understood. Yeah. When I'm, so two things, one, I, want, I don't know um, if there are other questions in the continuing revolution room, but maybe we can get a series of questions if there, if there are, um, and, well, while, while, while we're waiting to see, I'll just say that um, I don't know if I'm an artist, but I, you know, I'm not this kind of artist, you know, like I'm not, I don't have any like paintings or anything like that. You know, I'm not sure what I am, but uh, I do, I do want to say that um, I, I think that there might be that the control, the initial control might be an illusion. I don't, I don't know that I that I start off having a lot of control over very much. And so I'll just, um, you know, I so often when when things that I may have imagined as mine are. I, I, I see other people doing things with them. I, I, I try to dig deep to think about 
when and where yeah. I, I came to imagine something that approximates control or ownership. Um, you know, because it, you know, even even if it's something that I that I did that I think is, you know, sort of creative in nature, I think about, you know, sort of who who gave me that idea, who gave me that vision, whose body is this is more driven, you know, who 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 made me like this color. And so I don't, you know, I I, I think about in the same way I might think about shared land stewardship, I think about what it means to 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 acknowledge all the 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 parts of me that were co-created and and what it and and, and where I where I think that the for me that that the issues come up are really often about capitalism, about you know a particular kind of commodification and marketing, which which then can sort of um, create hierarchies of value that don't have to be there. You know, like if it, you know if it's something and we're all just sort of playing together in the sandbox, then you know some people create different things. Um, then then that's one thing. But you know if, if one person um, gets riches that allow them to own Google's earth and other people, you know, starve to death, you know, based on the, on the valuation system, then we, you know, that's, it's about more than just control. It's about sort of the consequences of control. It's about the, the resource inequities that flow out of the misappropriation, um, the, you know, that, it's only when certain people own this house that it gets to be worth a million dollars and only when certain people live in this neighborhood and only, you know, so I, so, so I think of, for me, I'm, I'm not interested in the control. Um, and when I'm participating in something that didn't start initially um, as a question of control or ownership and someone else comes in, um, to this open shared space and then owns it and patents it and then sells it back to me so that, you know, I have to purchase my air and water, you know, if I'm lucky enough to be able to afford them, I think, you know, sort of that becomes something else. And so I think about really sort of the, the, the perversion of sort of a capitalist framework. Yeah. I don't know if there are other people who have Answers or questions, Lena? I saw that you a group does right now. Uh, none more from um, the young adults in the continuing revolution room, and we are going to need to to move to close. I think. Um, I'll leave it incomplete. I can feel that impulse to to keep putting a bow on it, um, but. I just so appreciate that you opened so many questions and so many answers and invited us into so many questions and so many answers together. I'm just going to put another time in the chat uh, if you want to read more about these wonderful artists, um, think more about these themes of uh, aiming for freedom and reparation together. Um, there's a link there um, and you can connect directly with the artist's work at some of the websites that are linked in their bios. Um, We'll just close with a brief moment of silence um, and then uh, say good night and lots of gratitude. Thank you, Fran. Thank you again for being with us this evening. We'll end it here um, and wish good rest to you all when you rest. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Destiny. Thank you, Daryl, Marla, Melkor. Thank you so much. Oh, well, Thank, you. <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you, speakers, for sharing. Good night. Bye.